Um, in addition to the rounded corners and in addition to the rounded corners and also to shadows, we can make shapes uh, more transparent. Rather, we can add um, a transparency effect to a shape, right, or to a an element. And so we do that with the opacity property, right? Opacity determines how transparent an object appears, and the value um, for this, this property should be somewhere between 0 and 1. And so 1 means that the object is entirely opaque. And let me just highlight this real fast, um, just like our friend right here. Whereas if we decrease that value, you see that it becomes more and more transparent. Right? And I'll show you what that looks like here in just a second with uh, CSS. Right? Here's just a quick recap. We use that border radius. We use box shadow. And now we're going to go ahead and we're going to add opacity, OK? Um, let's go with 0.2 as our value. Let's see what happens to that lovely yellow. So notice that, that our, our shadow is still there. Our shadow is also, um, also a little bit more transparent too, which I think is super interesting. I think it's really cool um, that we were able to do that with the, the opacity property. But uh, everything else you just see, if uh, another thing that, that I really want to make sure that we point out is that if, if you added another element and that element happened to be overlapped by this uh, relatively transparent element, what you would see is, is that element in the background. And it's really, really important that you make sure that, that you remember that because um, that overlap could cause a, a, an effect that, that might not be pleasing to a user. So do keep that in mind, okay? All right, um, and actually let me go ahead and show you really fast what that would look like. So if I find the slide that we were just on, I apologize, I don't want to take too much of your time, but if I add this and then I send this to the back, Notice that uh, this object sits on top, and you can actually see through this object in order to see the entirely, entirely opaque shape right here. Now, if I change the color of this shape in order to, to further demonstrate this point, um, it makes it a little bit easier to see, right? If it's the same color, it doesn't really have the same effect. But you can see that this shape is overlaid on top of the shape in the background, and that's going to, uh, to <clears throat> that could potentially rather cause some problems later on. Okay, so keep in mind as you guys are, are developing your web pages uh, to use opacity wisely. Okay, all right. So back to our presentation. Um, let's talk about background gradients. Um, a gradient is a smooth transition from one color to another. And in CSS3, you can apply gradients um, to just about anything, right? Um, headers, footers, buttons, shapes, um, uh, you know, vector graphics. Um, they're applied through the, the background property. And then you actually use methods, right? So if I have, have the background property in use, I'm going to uh, to, to add in linear gradient as a value. So if I have linear gradient right here, I would add that in as a value. And then there's some other uh, coding that I have to do in order to make, make best use of that method. So um, to give you guys an idea of, of how, how linear, linear gradients function, they can be from the top to the bottom, from bottom to top, or from corner to corner, or, or even side to side. Um, a default gradient is going to go from, from top to bottom. Okay. How we implement this is, is kind of tricky. It's very different from the way that we, we implement, implement a lot of our other uh, properties within CSS3. And so the best way to explain this is to actually just show you an example. Okay. So um, give me a quick second here, and I'll switch over. And we'll show you an example. All 
All right, so we've got our code up on screen now, and I'm going to change the class for my block from rounded to gradiented. Um, I'm pretty sure that that's not even a word, and of course I misspelled it. Um, I can't verify that for you, but it, it is important to make sure that you use names for your classes and for for your um, your IDs that aren't the same as, as some of the properties that you're using or some of the keywords that you'll use, right? Like you wouldn't want to make an ID um, for HTML for or sorry, for, or for called P for for a P tag or um, called uh, called H1 for an H1 tag. It, it just wouldn't be a good a good idea. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at this code though. In action, I'm going to make sure I save it first. Launch the browser there, and here you have a block, right? With gradient, and let's take a look at at our, our CSS here, okay? And let's talk about what this does. So right now, we've got this beautiful block. It goes to top, which means that it starts from the bottom. It starts as a white. And it's completely white until it hits the 20% mark. At that point, it starts transitioning gradually to blue until it hits the 80% mark, where it's going to be entirely blue from there. Okay? We can go ahead, if we change this to from to top to bottom and then save, I'm gonna refresh the page, and all of a sudden I flip the gradient. Okay? Super cool. It's a, a tiny little touch. Um, let's let's take a look at a couple of other things too. I, if I'm not mistaken, and I might be wrong, I might have to go back and check. You can also um, let's do 110 degrees. I think that you can add in a degree as a property in order to change the gradient. Yeah, and there it is, right? So I've done the same thing, but I've actually I've started up in this this top left corner. Um, at 110 degrees, and then the gradient moves down towards the right corner. So pretty cool stuff. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and comment this out now. And then I'm going to uncomment this next example um, before I actually go on to talk about it on our presentation. All right, so next we'll talk about radial gradients, right? They start from the center of an object and then they radiate outwards and they actually can take different shapes. They can either be like a perfect circle or they can be an ellipse which is, is sort of like an oval, right? Um, and we're talking about a rudimentary definition there. The, the first values with the gradient, uh, radial gradient method are going to determine the horizontal and, and vertical center values, so where the gradient is going to start. So let's um, take a look at that in action, okay? So we're going to use the same colors, white and blue. Sorry if that gets boring. I have no idea why I picked them, just because. All right, so I'm going to make sure to save this, and then we're going to pop open our browser window, and we're going to go ahead and refresh. And there we have an awesome radial gradient. And notice um, I said ellipse at center. But if I change those values, let's do um, 10 and then 10, and let's see what happens here. Uh-oh, I messed up. Oh. Now I'm just hitting all sorts of combinations of things that I don't want to hit. All right. Let me actually go back to my presentation because I may have made a mistake and honestly guys, I can't recall. Um, if you ever run into a situation like this, all I would do is stop what you're doing, go to Bing, right, bing.com, and do a quick search for the property. It'll be super helpful. You'll easily find your way out of a jam. I'm gonna move forward because sometimes that's what basically you should just do, right? Um, and with that being said, let's move on to talk about 2D and 3D transformations. Um, so graphic effects are, are awesome, but at, at the end of the day, 
you know, they're not as cool. Like I said, we've been been using these in, in PowerPoints forever and for Word documents forever. And, and so, you know, what what is really fascinating, what is really engaging is is when we add 2D and 3D transformations. So like any kind of animation or something along those lines um, that that changes an object from its original shape or form. Um, all right, without further ado, um, you know, a transform, we'll start there with the basic definition. It's an effect that lets you change the size, shape, and position of an element. Um, this includes just basically rotating, scaling, stretching, spinning, and moving elements. Um, to add transformations, all you have to do is add the transform property with one of its methods. Um, an important thing to understand is that that transform by itself is not going to implement an animation. In fact, um, you actually have to use um, a key, the, the sorry, uh, um, oh, I forget the name. We'll, we'll talk about it here in just a second, I promise you. I'm starting to lose it, guys. So keep following me, okay? But you, you don't animate, you just transform. So when you refresh a page, the element itself transforms from the way that you had it initially in its code, but a user's never going to see that transformation. Really important there. There are tons of different methods that are involved with the transform property, and we're only going to cover a few of them today, okay? Um, like I, I've said before, you know, go to Bing, look for the Microsoft Developer Network, and, and do a quick look up for the transform property. It'll be super helpful. All right, so let's get started with translations. Um, 2D translations are going to move elements without rotating, skewing, or turning the image, right? All that it does is it moves it from its original location to a brand new location. And let's go ahead and take a quick look at a demo for translations. So I'm going to increase the size of my web matrix window, snap it, open up my transforms demo. Um, let's see here. And then I want you guys to see that I've, I've actually got all of my CSS stored inside of a, a transforms.css file. So what I'm going to do is we're going to walk through all these transitions and, and I've actually got, um, got an animation here. So get pretty excited for that one. Uh, and, and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to change the class each and every time. I may have to come back and check the class name to make sure I'm implementing it correctly. But um, but th this is really the benefit of, of using a CSS file and then linking that file to your HTML file, okay, to your HTML document. So I open this up. I'm going to double check my link to make sure that I've properly linked to my CSS file, right? Transforms.css. Note that uh, transforms.css is in the same file folder as my transforms demo.html file, so I don't need to add a folder name. If transforms.css happened to be in, say, managing text flow, I would have to go ahead and add that name, you know, managing um, underscore text flow, and then a forward slash. And that would allow me to properly link it in a different folder. So something to keep in mind for later, um, not tested on the exam but exceptionally important whenever you're creating web apps and, uh, and web pages. Anyway, all right, back to the topic of transforms. I'm going to go ahead and we want to add we want to add the, uh, the translated class, okay, because that's where my transform property is being used. 